to Beyond Your Balance Sheet from the Sedora Group of Stewart Partners Global Advisory. I'm Laura Canoy. Today, the intersection between financial planning and wider life goals, our hopes and dreams that are about more than just simply money. Our guests are the founders of this program, Tom Sidoric, Partner and Executive Managing Director of the Sidoric Group of Steward Partners Global Advisory. And Tom, welcome back to Beyond Your Balance Sheets. Great to see you. Laura, thanks so much for having me. Well, also with us is Casey Snyder, Managing Director at the Sidoric Group. And Casey, a big welcome to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Good to be here. So, both of you gentlemen have backgrounds in the social sciences. Casey, you were a dual major in psychology and sociology. Tom, you were a dual major in finance and psychology. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, I think a lot of people would find this surprising. How does that background in the social sciences affect the way that you do your work now as financial planners? And Tom, I'll go to you first, please. Well, we've learned over the years that so much of people's financial journey is often an emotional one. So having the background in the social sciences has been immensely helpful for, for both of us. Uh, I had planned on being an HR staffer for a big, large corporation, but instead, instead saw the value of having some of the psych, psychological skills benefit people in their life journey. And it's been incredibly helpful. And so much of people's financial decision-making revolves around their personality. Wow. And Tom, do you think most people in your field come to it with that perspective and that background in psychology and, and social sciences? I can say that I think a lot of people probably wish they had. And I know that a right. number of larger firms, uh, ours included, are looking at some of the psychological aspects of their clients uh, and bringing staffers in that have unique talents in that area. And I think it's a really important development. I think it's a really valuable development, quite frankly. Wow, that's really interesting. Casey, what's your perspective on this? I'd say it's similar. And, and I had originally wanted to pursue a career in uh, therapy. Um, I wanted to be a marriage counselor and then sort of stumbled across financial planning in a in a obscure way and fell in love with it right away. But to Tom's point, emotions largely drive behavior. And when it comes to trying to plan for someone's future, it's really important that we take into account those emotions, those behaviors, and kind of help guide them in alignment with what's most important to them. So I think the social sciences background comes in. Uh, it's an incredibly important perspective that we leverage or rely on quite a bit and probably more than what people would think. So Casey, how much of your day-to-day -day work is crunching the numbers, the balance sheet, so to speak, and how much of your time would you say is spent on acting as kind of a coach or a, a therapist even? I think it ebbs and flows, but I would say it's almost a 50-50 in the sense that we do a lot of number crunching in support of goals, but when it comes to being in client meetings, having those conversations about what's most important, having that social sciences background, it's a bit of coaching. I don't want to say it's therapy in that sense, but it's really helping somebody identify what's most important to them and then being able to support those goals with the number crunching. So it's kind of a back and forth, part art, part science combination. Okay. And you really, this is where the, the therapist background comes in, Casey, right? You have to know how to ask the right questions to help the person come to their own personal answers. Correct. It's meant to be a very empowering process. Um, and for that to happen, people have to have their own aha moments. They they need to be in the driver's seat. We are merely there to help educate, uh, steward, um, and, and kind of help look around corners on their behalf. Tom, what about you? I'm struck by what Casey says that Obviously, there's an ebb and flow, but maybe 50% of his time is acting more in that coaching role or that uh, therapist role. How about you? Yeah, I think Casey's right uh, about the ratios, although I think the ratios, uh, to his point, ebb and flow over time and depending on the client. In many cases, um, 
the fine the balance sheet may not be the issue the decision making and the choices the client is facing is where they really need, need us and our planning uh, expertise to come to bear on their affairs so it really does change i would say my career path uh 30 years ago 80 percent of my time was spent looking at the portfolio construction and i'd say the inverse is probably true today that the portfolio comes secondary to the plan that we've crafted the decisions and the goals the client wants to attain okay so you need to tell me more about that because now i'm intrigued tom so is that because you've changed or the clients have changed or both because that shift is is very interesting it's a great question it's probably a little of all of the above um i think it's because and I give Casey credit in this regard. I had a very successful practice that was running for 20, 25 years, taking care of people's balance sheets. Uh, but the planning process is really what drives the balance sheet. Uh, and Casey joined our practice, uh, well, 13 or 14 years ago, but officially uh, over a decade ago. And the, the financial planning skills that he brought to bear for our clients has been immensely empowering to his point. Uh, to a point where we now focus much more on the plans and the ba and the balance sheet and the portfolio really are are secondary. Wow. So Casey, you often say in the introduction to this program that true fulfillment extends far beyond the numbers on one's balance sheet. So what kind of fulfillment do you hear people talking about, Casey? And as a follow up to that, what do you try to add to those conversations when people think about fulfillment? I would start by saying what it's not. And I very rarely, if ever, have heard somebody speak about fulfillment as it relates to their account balances. I've never heard it. Uh, nobody comes in here talking about how happy they are because of a quarterly statement or a monthly statement or an account balance. What I see most, I think, is that fulfillment realized by means of somebody being able to achieve more control over their time. And I think that balance sheet certainly is a supporting role in that. But I think what, what I see a lot of is fulfillment as it relates to the relationships they have in their life, whether it be family or friends. And I, I, I see fulfillment in the form of contentment and the ability to kind of exercise the mind, body, heart, and soul. And I think it's unique to each individual in terms of how they go about finding that fulfillment, because there is that delicate balance between making sure that it's affordable, but it's up to the individual and the, their family to help find what's most important. So it, it, it differs. It could be travel for somebody while it could be uh, giving back to the community for somebody else or a combination of the two. Um, that's what I see in terms of fulfillment. So as people, Casey, look at what they mean by fulfillment, how they define it, you say, okay, let's see if I can help you find a balance sheet that supports that. Maybe it means making less money, but having more time with family. Maybe it means, you know, having less money on the balance sheet, but you've also taken some fabulous vacations. So it's, it's very individual. Um, it sounds like. Yeah. And I think something else to add is it, it, it ebbs and flows too. This is not a linear path. What may be important to somebody in their 40s may change in their 50s, which may change again in their 60s. And it's finding that balance. I think the balance is the hardest thing for people to find, but when they find it, you can see it. You can see it on their face. You can see it in their energy. You can see it in terms of their fulfillment. When they come in, they're really, I don't want to say optimistic, but they're happy. Um, and it does. It's 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 not a linear path, and that's why it's a constant process. It's it's collaboration. It's engagement. It's being honest with oneself, and coming back to something you just mentioned, Laura. It's about asking really important questions versus surface level questions. Yeah. So, Tom, how do you cross over into that line, if I could put it that way, into those deeper conversations? about fulfillment and what it truly means to a person? Because some people might think that's kind of a personal question. So how do you approach that, that very deep conversation? You know, it's a great question, Laura. And typically the client will lead us uh, in that direction. They will tell us what is important to them, what they're trying to achieve, whether it be for family, for their community, 
uh, whatever it is. Um, I think the greatest thing that we provide, and we hear it repeatedly from our clients, is what's called the peace of mind factor, where they don't have to worry about the details. That's our job, and we do really do worry about the details a great deal so they can live their lives. I've got a, a stack of notes under my desk of almost 40 years of caring for families, uh, and it's all thank you notes. And it's not about what their account statement said month to month or quarter to quarter. It's about what they were able to accomplish uh, and the life goals that they achieved and the, the family planning and the travel and the, the, the just the peace of mind they received. And that, that to me is incredibly rewarding for me personally and, and for them individually. Right. You're making a difference, a real difference in people's lives. And both of you had touched on uh, the topic of retirement. And I do want to talk to both of you about that because that's a big part of your work. But first, as you both know, a major focus of this series, a subject we've touched on several times, is the importance of mental and physical health. And of course, there's the stereotypical workaholic who can't seem to stop working to take care of themselves. Uh, Tom, to you first, how much does that stereotype still hold um, among the people that you see? I, I think it's a good question. We we typically don't use the word retirement a, a great deal in our practice. We talk about encore pursuits, encore careers. You know, I've got a number of folks that have got all the money they need to to pay their bills, but they still are doing research on World War II matters, uh, the U.S. Navy in 1933. We've got some fascinating individuals we serve that that they have enough money to pay their bills and to put food on the table and to give back to their community, but they're still very, very involved. So they're not sitting around watching TV, I can assure you that. Right. In terms of their mental health, though, Tom, how do you sort of view that um, issue that we focused on so many times in this program, how do you approach conversations with clients who may be having um, some mental health struggles of their own or within their families? This is well, once like again, a, we a let them leave society. Us. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We may ask them if they feel like they need some professional coaching. We're not obviously psychologists professionally, so right. we can bring in those resources if they ask for them. In many cases, they'll already have somebody in the mix that's a family, you know, therapist or a, a spiritual guide, whatever. But long and the short of it is we listen to them uh, and then we help craft the balance sheet that will support their goals and give them that peace of mind. So ultimately, we're in the business of providing peace of mind, which does enhance mental health, quite frankly. Wow. Okay. I can see the connection there. And Casey, go ahead and, and weigh in. Why has it been so important to include this topic of mental health several times in this uh, series yeah. that we've been working on together, Beyond Your Balance Sheet? I think when I think about the relationships that we have with our clients, they tend to be very personal relationships. Um, and I think if, if, if they share with us and if we notice that there are some challenges, especially on the mental health side of things, or if they're facing some challenges that may lead to some mental health related obstacles, you know, candidly, sometimes it's a matter of, of, of letting them know the plan's not going to matter if we don't make it through this next chapter. Now, all the work that we've put in up until now, it's not going to matter it's, if we don't carve out enough time to take care of something that's obviously very important. And I think time and time again, we've seen households or families with from afar who appear to have all the money in the world kind of thing. And you know that from a financial perspective, they're accounted for, they're good. Their children may be well-to-do as well already, but you can see that they're not happy. You can see that they don't have that fulfillment. They haven't found the right balance. And it may be for a variety of reasons, but Again, if we're in the in the if our role is to help somebody find success, to find their fulfillment, I think to ignore that mental health side of things, um, we're really not acting as a fiduciary in that situation. So we're not the expert. By no means am I trying to suggest that this is our area of expertise. It's not. But I do think it's important that we have that candid conversation. And if we have that personal relationship in place already, 
it's a natural conversation. It's not a um, an uncomfortable one. Right. And in this series, we've heard from a father um, and his own personal journey with his son's mental illness. We've heard from someone who um, specializes in mental health first aid, basically the idea that anybody can help someone who is in distress. We've heard from a national expert on anxiety. So um, that's that's been a focus of this series and all to the good, uh, as I'm hearing from both of you. I also wanted to ask you about planning and how much you see people planning for the maybe unpredictable or the unplannable. Clearly people get your help planning for retirement, for maybe buying a house, for saving for their children's college. But Casey, to you first, uh, how much do you see people planning for life's unpredictable events? Uh, that's a mix. I mean, that's a loaded question. I think some individuals and families are more inclined to want to plan for the unexpected. And I think others struggle in getting there. And I think part of it is associated with this sort of optimism bias that many of us have in the sense that we tend to overestimate positive outcomes in our lives. And many of us tend to underestimate the more negative or challenging obstacles that stand in our way. And I think that's one of our roles is to help people to use Tom's phrase is we help people look around corners and corners that they may not even know are there, but because of our role and position in speaking with so many different families and individuals over time, we know that these events are more common than anyone would like to believe. Um, and it's and it's making sure that we can remain pragmatic and that that is our role as a fiduciary um, to be able to provide that pragmatic advice and make sure that people are paying attention to the things that they don't want to have happen, but do. so very every person every family is different there are different ways of approaching that but we spend a lot of time doing so well it reminds me of the episode we did on insurance and whether people have enough insurance um what about optimism bias tom how do you talk to clients about planning for the possible disaster without sounding too negative or too foreboding well, we can always highlight the fact that Casey Snyder's house burned down rather suddenly a, a year and a half ago and and how that they, they prevailed throughout that whole, whole ordeal and how they made lemonade from lemons. And quite frank, frankly, they have. Um, I look at what he's been able to accomplish personally and professionally uh, despite the tragedy and, and and it's absolutely magnificent. And we see... We see optimism bias. We also see people that come in and they're incredibly pessimistic about the future and the world's going to come to an end. And we have to blow a little rainbow at them once in a while to say, hey, look, have you thought about the fact that you're really in better shape than you thought? And you can you can take that trip if you wish. and You can help your grandchildren. Uh, and so once you kind of peel back the onion a little bit and, and talk about the details, it gives them, a, again, a great deal of peace of mind. One of, one of the things key things that I think is happening in a, in a general fashion is that people are much more comfortable now talking about very personal matters, whether it be addiction, mental health, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's all on the table now. And I think that's a very encouraging set of developments for, for our society and quite frankly, for us too. Tom, I wanted to ask you a question that I know you think a lot about, and that is, what do you hear from folks about what they wished they knew or understood about money earlier on in their lives? It's a great question. I can tell you plain and simple, people don't under, people totally underestimate the impact of taxes on their affairs. Uh, for decades, uh, the old retirement plan was made up of what was called a pension so that the individuals didn't have to worry about their savings. The, pen, the company was gonna take care of them. Uh, and today they have to think about their own 401k, their IRA, how they're going to fund their retirement and taxes are a really critical element. And, and many of them wish they'd learned that much earlier in their career. Trust me. Oh, that's interesting. So let's talk a little bit more about retirement. Um, Casey, to you first, what's the classic way that people used to think about retirement and how do you, Casey, try to get your clients to think about retirement? And I think Tom already touched on it briefly, but I think the 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 old classic way was that it was an end goal, that you, you, you work all these years to reach this end goal of retirement, and it is not an end goal. It is a uh, 
it's an accomplishment that kicks off the next chapter. And so we really, I think a lot of people work 30, 40 years to reach this milestone and then kind of put their hands up and go, okay, now what? When in reality, we still have 20, 30 plus years to account for. And there are a lot of passions um, that can still be pursued. And again, whether it be giving back to the community, whether it be spending more time with family, whether it be travels, whether it be an encore career in itself, there are so many different things that people can do. And this comes back to having control over one's time. It's not necessarily balance sheet related, but the balance sheet certainly contributes to that. But when you have control over your time, it redefines retirement. And especially if you have your overall kind of mental health and, and, and physical well-being, uh, there's still a lot to accomplish and a lot yeah, to do. That reminds me of the episode we did about Encore careers. So um, Tom, how about you? You've been in this profession for many years. What shifts have you seen in terms of how people view retirement? So we just use the term multiple times. It's really the fact that people don't think about retirement as I'm going to go sit at sit at the home and watch TV and, and play Canasta. That's far from the, the case. People now are thinking about their pursuits, their careers, and, and what they can use in their career to help the community, help their family, and give back, quite frankly. We see incredible amounts of active participation, uh, volunteer activities. It's just fascinating to watch and we're really excited. So one last big question for both of you gentlemen and Tom, I'll go to you first. What is the one piece of advice, be it financial or more on the personal end that you find yourself giving people over and over again? Find a trusted partner early on uh, the little the nuanced changes that can be made in a financial plan when you're in your 30s can have profound impact later on when you're old and gray like me. Uh, so find a trusted professional you can work with early, not late. Okay, C people coming to us when they're 65 and say, okay, I'm ready to retire. There's not a lot of, we don't have a lot of a room that we can do, do much. But if somebody comes to us in their 40s, 30s or 40s, there's a lot we can do. Uh, and that's what I would say is get get involved with fiduciary early. Yeah, interesting. And people in their 30s and 40s may think, oh, I'm not making enough. Um, it's not worth it. But it sounds like it is worth it, Tom. It is. And, and financial literacy is something that we talk about a great deal. Uh, it's something in our society, unfortunately, has not done a great job fostering, but we do. How about you, Casey? Is there one piece of advice you find yourself dispensing almost daily? Yeah, and I think it's two things combined. I think the first is to really focus on the elements of the financial planning process that you have control over. There are way too many things beyond our control that people spend too much time on um, versus the elements that we do have control over, whether it be cash flow awareness or savings goals or setting realistic expectations, you know, thoughtful conversations, that sort of thing. I think you combine that with the second, which is that life does not live within a spreadsheet. So as much as we do enjoy crunching numbers and planning, we also know that uh, a fulfilling life often lives between that sort of uh, emotionally charged desire to do something and the spreadsheet over here on the other side, life lives within that gray area. And I think having that spreadsheet and then spending time on the variables that we do have control over really allows somebody to live in that middle ground, that gray area with a lot of success and a lot of happiness over time. Well, we will wrap it up there, but I want to thank both of you very much for being with me today. It's been great. Tom, thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Laura. That's Tom Sidoric, Partner and Executive Managing Director of the Sidoric Group of Steward Partners Global Advisory. And Casey Snodder, thank you to you as well, of course. Thank you, Laura, as always. That that's Casey Snyder, Managing Director at the Sidoric Group. Beyond Your Balance Sheet is sponsored by the Sidoric Group of Steward Partners Global Advisory. And I'm Laura Canoy. Thanks everyone for being with us.